Hi, good morning. Get over to your seat. Yeah, you could get that. Yeah. All your books and stuff. Oh, okay. Hmm. Let's see here. The clicky thingy is in here. Cool. All right. Turn this over here. Huh? Hey, go get her. I'll go back. I'll go back home. I'll take the night off. No problem. <coughs> Cheap. Yep. I'm sure it'd be very interesting theolo- theologically. All right. Well, let's get started. Today. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless this service and bless all that we do tonight, Lord, as we can endeavor, Lord, to hear your voice in amazing ways. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to continue our series, hearing God's voice, and. Uh, Tonight we have, uh, well, we're going to do thoughts from, well, this is a lie, thoughts from not last week, but two weeks ago, because last week we did the movie. Uh, I, I just figured if I could change that slide, but then I have to change it again next week, so I just leave it the way it is. So, uh, so reflections from the last two weeks ago. You had a lot of time to think about these. Ask God to show you areas in your life where you can choose to have a different response. Anybody want to go first on that one? You will? I'm so glad you come to these classes. <clears throat> All right. She's perfect. Mirror of you. That sometimes that 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 God uses that. Anybody else want to share <clears throat> on this one? What's an area you could have a different godly response in? Everybody here is perfect. Oh, that's great. Oh, no. Cool. So what would you write down? Oh, no. Yeah, Dion. The people sit way in the back. All right, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's, that, that's the thing. You know, we, it, it's basically to see how it is with other people. You know what? I mean, we, we want to have to, the reason this question is there is because if the whole world was just us in the world, there'd be no issues, right? If it was just us, <clears throat> we really wouldn't need to hear from God because what? No one else around to bother us, no one else to make us things. You know, godly response is only when it refers to someone because we don't really need to respond to ourselves. And how we act in this world determines how we interact with God, right? Because here's the deal. If our response, see, I, I hear this a lot. Well, you know, when, when I'm with the Lord, I, I, I got this. But pastor, when I'm at my job or when I'm at this, I'm, I'm different. <clears throat> you wonder why God don't speak. Because you're being what? Yeah, two different personas, right? You know, you're, you're one way here and one way there. I got to act this way here because of this and this way. What, what, God says act my way all the time, right? And if you do that, well, it might cause me issues. Well, no, it won't cause you issues. It'll cause other people issues. And sometimes, you know, sometimes God causes us issues and roadblocks in life, not, not to harm us, but to open our eyes to go in another, what, direction that's actually better for us. You know, I've known people like, yeah, well, I, I, I got I to gotta do what the company says. I got to do exactly what, okay, but if it's, if it's not a godly response, you know, the other phrase, everybody's what? Everybody, 
<laughs> you know, yeah, that, that, that person, that it, we, we just, just the way it is, that's how we treat the boss. Like, okay. But you know what, you know, God says treat everybody like you would treat who? No. What's the Bible say how to retreat people? Well, we want to be treated, right? God wants you to look at the world and imagine you are the only person in the world. And everybody else is a clone of you. Because see, if you did that, you looked at everybody else like you, you wouldn't beat yourself up typically. Now, there are some people that do do that on purpose, and, and, and they have the woe is me lifestyle. But the normal human being... If you had a choice to, if you had a choice to 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 to, to do good to yourself or or to cut and, and hurt yourself, would you? Which one would you normally choose? The good, right? A normal, if I were a a normal person, person, right? <laughs> the non-normal people we have the little padded room for. Okay, all right. Are you telling me you're a candidate for the padded room? No, don't answer that question. Don't 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 answer that question. I, 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 I am a mandated reporter, okay, so please don't answer that question, all right. <laughs> uh, well, only deals with minors, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, we, 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 he wants us to deal with how our responses are, and it's not just the big things, you know, how they respond to little things. Like me, uh, one of my little things is, is when the stupid computer doesn't know what the stupid computer wants to do. Is that a good way to respond? No, it isn't, because you know what, the, is the computer alive? No, but you know what, but I could take that attitude towards something else very easily, can't I? You know, it, it, it's an inanimate object, but you can do that. I have been found, actually the last few weeks, Rend and I have both had interesting issues with the computers here at the church. <laughs> uh, just, just amazingly dumb things that happen. Uh, we, we, we upgraded our stuff to, 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 to a nice T1 line and all this stuff, and some days I think it's worse than it was before. Uh, I don't understand why well, I am paying more money. <laughs> and they tell me, it's so much better. Now, in here, it's great. But I'm only in here one day a week and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. I'm over there the rest of the time. And it's like, okay, all right. Uh, it's, they, they promised online would be awesome. It has fixed that problem. It has created other problems. <laughs> but you know what? But how? To that. How, how, how we deal with that, you know, how we respond, you know, look at areas you'd like to see how we respond, because, you know, little things, you might say, that's oh, no big deal. The things that are no big deal are the things you with, and then they, they pile on. And here, here's the thing, you, you, you get a bunch of things that are no big deal, the problem is they're still, they're still in your life, and a bunch of things eventually become what? One giant thing. <clears throat> You know, you know when people really go over the tipping point about Jesus or a church or something like that? It, it, it's, it's not the, the last thing that sets them off. And the, the people will say, that, that's why I'm all mad. No, no, it's usually like the 30 or 40 of the things below it that they what? Never what? Dealt with in their life. <clears throat> and learn how the godly respond. We said, what would Jesus do? Jesus always responded what? In a godly way. That is our example. That's who we're supposed to imitate. Will we ever get to that level? Not on this planet. Nope, because we're not perfect, okay? We're supposed to strive for that, because the more we do that, even in the, the just, just little things in life will make the bigger things in life so much better. But here's the thing. The big things in life are all composed of a bunch of little details. And when one little detail's off, it messes everything else up. And how we do that. Now, we're not going to be perfect at this. Like, you know, look at families. Okay? You know, everybody can love the family, but the one person shows up you don't like. Ruins the whole party, right? But did the person showing up ruin the party or your attitude towards that person ruin the party? That's right. That person has no control over you whatsoever. Remember, we talked about determinism. Uh, Lexi was waving at me and was wondering why. My daughter got here now. Okay. You're going to pretend you didn't hear that. But, you know, you know, we talked about determinism. You know, no one else can determine your life. No one else can make you feel bad. You know, people go, you know, and I hear this sometimes. People come to church. Well, this person looked at me this way. This happened there. It's like, okay, great. Are you coming for them or are you coming for who? For God. You know what? The better attitude you have, maybe you can change them. Maybe they are terrible people. I don't know. I don't know all your lives. You all could be lying to me. I don't know. Uh, but you know what? You know, if we have the right attitude, we fix those things. Now we talked about what? If you want to fix a problem in your life, what do you need to do? Two weeks ago, Sunday morning. Huh? Not confronted how? If someone's causing you a problem, do what? And? 
Thank you. Bless them. Bless them. Yeah. Conf- yeah. You know, how you confront them, you can one of two ways. You can either go royally wrong, or it could still go wrong, but it goes right on your end. You just want to make sure your end's right. You don't have to worry about their end. You can never change anybody else. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Okay? Only what we can do. And that's what we got to, and we got to work at it, because we're going to do dumb things. And when you do something dumb, then what? Say you did something dumb. You might say, but they've done a lot of dumb things too. Okay, sure. But when you stand before God in heaven, he's going to ask you about your dumb things. God says, keep your focus here, here and there. When you get focused sideways is when things go wrong. God says, focus where you are, a vertical relationship, up and down. Okay? You know, I know Mary Lou's sick tonight. She's not here, but she has a favorite, favorite saying uh, whenever I ask her how she's doing. She says, I'm upright and sucking air, right? That's what she says, okay? Pray for her. She's not feeling good today. Uh, but you know what? She's upright and she's sucking air. Make, make sure, you know, say, hey, hey. Here we go, right? This is the way you want. So it wants us to be a vertical relationship with God. And we do that, guess what? Then we don't look, what, on the, on the sides. And we keep our eyes on the Lord, guess what? And he can direct their paths. And things will go better. But the more better we practice godly relationships, see, if we don't have godly relationships or godly responses, that's what I'm talking about, not relationships, but that, that's part of the thing. But if we have a godly response, that helps us keep the right, our right attitude, and then God can speak to us. Because when you don't have a godly response, and you're anti- acting in a godly way, how can God speak with you? How many times people get mad? God, I just want to talk to you. But, and, wait a second. Would God talk about that person that way? No, he wouldn't, would he? So how do you expect to have a conversation between you and God when your attitude or your response doesn't line up with what God says? Now, just so you know, I'm not doing that to criticize. I mean, I've had those moments, and God said, you dummy. And I'm like, yes, Lord, you're right. But you know what, we realize that because he wants to teach us. Now the next reflection is a little, maybe a little bit harder. <clears throat> Search the scriptures for people who made poor choices to see how they learn from their mistakes. Realize it's okay to make mistakes, but we must learn from them. So I'm going to give you the easy one because last week in your reading assignment, I gave, you, I gave you a person. His name was Peter, right? If you read your reading material, you first start out with Peter, what? He, he, he says, I won't deny you, and then what? He denies him three times, he even curses and all this stuff. You know, the interesting thing about that story, it's only like six verses long. But do you really think it just took that amount? I mean, it takes like six seconds to read it. Do you really think that's what really happened? You, you know, you think that's all the people he denied? You know, you, you think about it. He, he was riled up. You know, I, I think the Bible is very nice to Peter in that, in that section. <laughs> But then what happens in chapter 21 when he comes back, right? Jesus comes back and, sa- and he says what? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And then finally Peter impassionately responds, yeah, Lord, you know. Jesus says, and feed my sheep. I, I, I'm restored. What's Peter, what's Jesus do? He restores Peter. You know, he made poor choice. You know, now, now he, Jesus said you're going to, he's like, oh, I won't do that. But when push came to shove, what happened? He did. Was it a poor choice? Sure. Did Peter feel shame by that? Absolutely. But then what? What restored him? A poor choice doesn't keep him hearing the voice of God. A lot of people think, well, I've done something wrong. Just because you did something wrong doesn't mean God can't talk to you. Uh, We know that for two reasons. Number one, before you became a Christian, God spoke to you. God prompted you to become a Christian, right? So you were a sinner away from God, right? So he does talk to you when you're not in right 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 mind but he talks in a different way because he's trying to prod you and show you different things but you know what learn from mistakes oh, I, I, I guess I can't do what God wants me to do right now because I made this dumb mistake well we all will make those dumb mistakes so anybody else find somebody David what dumb mistake did he make or mistake murder yeah Oh, more than murder. I mean, that whole complex had a whole bunch of things there. Hey, I want this babe. I, I, he already had a bunch of wives. He already made mistake first, the fact that he had more than one wife, you know. You know, no, I mean, you know, 
The Bible is full of people who have more than one wife. Did God ever condone that? No. He just report what happens. Everybody had more than one wife had issues. Okay? Just, just the way it is. Okay? You know, God says one man, one woman. Okay? And his people, that be, you know, great Abraham, he had wonderful, you know, he, would, he had all kinds of issues because he took Hagar and said, he had all these different things. And then what? He, then, he, then he takes her and then what? He says, I want to have her. So you know what? I'm going to follow what God says. If I want to have her, her husband has to be dead. So I'll kill him. But I won't kill him. I'll have, the, I'll have my enemies kill him. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. Now, what happens? Does God restore David? Yeah. Is there a consequence? Yes, there was. David's next child will come away. Now, interesting. Did the child get... No, the child's in heaven, right? Right? Then the child didn't have to worry about growing up in David's footsteps. They didn't have to worry about bills or mortgages or things like that. God wasn't mean to the child. But God was definitely, you know, showing David, hey, there's a point to all this. And David, God didn't throw David. David didn't have this, still had a prosperous reign, still had things good to happen to him. But you know what? He had, God didn't stop communicating, but he communicated in what? A different way. What's another person in the Bible? Paul. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Paul's a, yeah, Paul was a mass murderer. You know, before and he writes more books about anybody else. Now the key thing she said there, he's a very religious person. Problem is if you grow up religious, you're probably gonna turn out to be a mean person, because religion puts people to wrong. It's all about relationship. I'll, I'll never get off harping on that thing. Because <clears throat> religion just says, I'm better than you. God never said that. God said we're all the same. We're all sinners saved by grace. Doesn't make one better than we can all pour ourselves. You know what religion says? I can get here and you can, and, and I, look how high I can get. I mean, I can get to, I'm, I'm a deacon, I'm a coroner, I'm this, I'm that. It's like, no, that's not what God ever meant. <clears throat> Find those things in the Bible. You know, every time God says you get higher in the church, it means you actually get what? Lower, right? You know, you're, you're supposed to serve, not be served. Problem is, a lot of people see that as this hierarchy to get up in the thing, and the higher up you get, the more people underneath you can command. Well, no, no, God commands we serve. <laughs> uh, but Paul, he had all that backing and he went out there. And here's the other thing. He was one of the most educated people. We know that because of how he goes through and how he proves the defense of the scriptures. Did Paul have all the scriptures? Now, here's the thing. Did Paul have all that at his feet before he met Jesus? He absolutely did. And he absolutely what? Ignored all the signs. You know, you think about it. We think Paul, great guy. You know what? He's actually worse than all of us. Here's the deal. We saw, we came to know Jesus, I, unless somebody in this room had a Damascus Road experience where God had to hit you over the head and say, hey, ah, yeah, what are you doing to me? And don't, don't think Jesus said, hey, Paul, why are you? Don't, don't think that's what happened. All right, the, the soldiers around him were blinded. Paul fell off his horse. You're not going to fall off your horse for some dainty little voice. But, you know, Paul had all the tools that we had. He, he, he's, you know, they, they, only the people in the, in the Pharisees and things like that had access to the Scriptures. He was a smart dude. Well, he couldn't have put two and two together. And then there was, you listen to Paul. He first comes into the story when Stephen's being stoned. But here's the thing, he, it says he stood by there, he was there the entire time listening to what was going on. Stephen gives an amazing sermon, a wonderful oratory about who Jesus is. But Paul doesn't put two and two together. You know why? He's part of the mob mentality. He's part of, you know, I tell you all the time on Wednesday nights for our headlines class, none of the stuff we talk about is anything new. It, it, you know, the what's going on in our world today was happening when Jesus was around. It was happening a thousand years before that when David was around. It's all the same stuff, just a, just a different way. It's a, it's, you know what blows my mind? is people come to tell me, man, the Lord's such a terrible place, and all these things, all these new things are happening. No, no, no. Read the Bible. Nothing is not new. It's just in a, it's just in a different, because we're experiencing it. We think it's bigger. You know, trust me, all this corruption is back. You read all the different stories of the Bible. It was just as corrupt and just the things going on, going on there. And in their time, they just because just because we have the air and stuff, it, things go faster. But trust me, rumors, things that that all happened. 
You know, all, all the stuff. Well, it, it, they must have had it easy back then. Okay, think about it. Rumors, people assassinating people's character, all happened too. But they didn't have Walmart to go buy go, go buy a pumpkin pie for, for, for Thanksgiving, right? They had to make the. I mean, actually, life was a lot tougher back then than it is today. Oh, what's another person? Then we'll go on to the night's lesson. Oh, we got two. We'll go. Abraham and Sarah, right? Yep, Abraham. Oh God, yeah, you're gonna have a kid. Great, praise the Lord. Yeah, 24 years. Thinks a long time. And in the meantime, he, he complains, God, where's my heir? And then God, then God shows up and makes the problems with him. And then as soon as that happens, what's he do? Well, I guess we're not going to have one ourselves. I guess God can't fulfill the promise. So he just did all this cool stuff. And I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go up with Hagar and make my own kid. That's what God meant. I yeah, know Sarah told him to do it too. Oh, they, 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 they were both, I mean, yeah, Sarah told him to do it, but he, Sometimes I look at that Bible. One day I'm going to do I'm, I'm going to do a series on the wimpy people of the of the Bible. Abraham, if you really look at Abraham's life, like you know this wonderful Abraham, the man of God, right? Everybody told him what to do, and he just did it. He goes to these countries. He's the rich guy. Oh, tell everybody you're my sister, not my wife. The guy was he wasn't like I I I, I think when I meet Abraham in heaven, he's going to look like the kid from the Diary of the Wimpy Kid. I think that's what he's going to look like. I, 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 you know, you see these pictures of this guy. I don't think he was all that confident in himself. Uh, you had one. Who? Samson. There's another one. Over and over again, he, he makes mistakes. You know, and then and, and finally at the end, he gets it. Well, he doesn't really get it. He thinks he gets it. He could have he did what he did and still got out of it because God loved him and all that. But, you know, he, 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 he let pride come to life. I'm the strong guy. I'm this and I'm this. And, and then what he, what he let into his life, instead of doing what God asked to do, he said, I'm a Nazareth. I'm going to do what God does. And what, what, what's it? His wandering little eye, right? You know, oh, this is going to be, okay, I want this. And, and, you know, it's like, hey, see what God, I'll trust God. But you know what, at the end of God, now when Samson gets caught, what happens? He's in the prison, and a beautiful verse in the Bible happens. Anybody know what verse it is? And it says, and then, close. And then Samson's hair began to grow again. You know what? You know, that was the source of his strength. He was not supposed to cut it. You know, the hair wasn't the source of his strength. It was his vow to God. It began to grow again. And it's a great thing about that because just because we do something absolutely cataclysmically wrong, the great thing about that verse is God doesn't just throw you out because of that. And he can restore you. All right, well, tonight we're going to go into our next lesson. I need some, well, I go upstairs. Can somebody do me a favor and pass out uh, so you can follow along tonight? Yeah, great, wonderful. All right. Got a long walk tonight because I got people in the back, so. Okay, so we're going to be talking uh, <laughs> this afternoon about um, public and private victories. Public and private victories. This, this portion of the class kind of sums up what happens and what has happened to many, many, many gifted people. No matter, again, no matter what the gifting is, what, what has happened, why some make it, why, why some don't make it. This is very important. Here's, here's what I've, I've learned to, to, in my life. There will be no consistent public victories, demonstrations of God flowing through you consistently. That's what that means. There'll be no consistent public victories without a history of consistent private victories. You have to have a history of doing things no one else knows you did. No one else knows you did it. So a history of private failure then sets you up
to live a lifestyle in an atmosphere of fear because you believe next time you come to a test, you'll fail it. And what you want to do is you want to set yourself up in a place where that you believe the next test you come to, you will pass it. And there's ways to do that. Obviously, asking God, prayer, life in Him, but there's practical ways of doing that too. Expecting to fail leads you to fear anything that presents itself to you. Because you remember the past failure you had. You, whether consciously or unconsciously, you will remember the last failure you had. And you'll eventually fear change because all it represents to you is another opportunity to fail. So past failures then will breed fear of failure and open the door for demonic attack. Why? Because fear and faith are the same thing. Fear and faith are the same thing. At its root, it's the same thing. What do you mean by that? This. They are both the belief that something that hasn't happened will happen. Fear and faith are the belief that something that hasn't happened will happen. Fear is the belief that something bad that hasn't happened will happen. Faith is the belief that something good that hasn't happened will happen. But they are both the belief that something that hasn't happened will happen. Fear leads to anxiety, and anxiety leads to depression. Proverbs, 20, Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. Makes what glad? Makes the heart glad. Makes the person glad. Gives hope. Gives a future to people. A history of private victories, on the other hand, will set you up in a lifestyle where you expect to be victorious even in difficult times. Even in the most optimum time of change, in the most erratic time of change, you'll expect to be victorious. You won't fear of change because you'll believe change leads something that will be good, leads to something that will be good. So private victories are seen by you and God uh, versus public victories are seen by you and the public. And obviously God sees it too. But private victories are seen by you and God and are comprised of small things that God asks you to do. For example, pick up the piece of paper on the floor. Well, it's not my job. That's a janitor here. He'll get that tonight. Son, pick up the piece of paper on the floor. But, Lord, that's not my job. Son, this is not about the paper. This is about your obedience. Will you be obedient? And then when you are, in turn, you have a, a realization, I succeeded in that moment. I succeeded in that moment. So just between you and God, between you and God, no one knows. I do things all the time between me and God. I'll tell, I'll tell a couple, then I'll lose my reward, but it gives you an illustration. You know, I, I, clean, I, I, I clean the bathroom pretty often, at least once or twice a week, here in our offices. I don't have to do that. But it's, it's, I, God would just test me and said, oh, do it. And I do it. Because I, I understand what happens when God asks you to do something and you say no? Then what happens is it, it instantly leaves a little mark that says, you know what, I may say no the next time, and I may not, I may not be, I may fail the next time, and the next time, and the next time, and the next time. And I've learned that little tiny things open the door, sit in the back seat, let somebody else go first, pay for that meal. Those little tiny things. Set the course for God working in my life, and I expect success to come in him. David has said it like this. I have, I have killed the bear. I have killed the lion. I'm going to kill Goliath. This is not a big deal. Who is this Philistine to stand before God? Had he not had the bear, had he not had the lion that nobody knew about, Nobody knew about it at the time, and had he, had, not, had he not had those experiences, he would not have had the courage to face Goliath. But you know what Goliath did? You know what the bear, you know what the lion, you know what Goliath did? They set him up to have courage at the greatest test of his life when he came to Ziklag and found his wife and children were taken, and the men, the 600 men who were with him, 
wanted to stone him. And it says in in, uh, 1 Samuel 31, And David strengthened himself in the Lord. Oh. See, you do one thing that's a small victory in one area, but it gives you strength in an entirely different area. And you have a history of success, and it leaves you with the feeling, I will succeed whatever God brings my way, because he will ensure it. Mm. That's, that, that issue is incredible. Now, what happens is, Therefore, when you don't seek recognition in the small victories that you do, then God is able to use those things to to comfort you, to strengthen you, to instill an inward steel rod in your backbone. And it it won't break when the pressure comes. Private victories often comprise small acts of obedience. They're like sand and concrete. The Holy Spirit is the concrete. Your little acts are the pieces of sand. They don't seem significant in themselves. But when you put them together and the Holy Spirit surrounds them, they become uh, that, that obedience of yours becomes incredibly strong. And here's what I've noticed. The thickness of your foundation is directly proportional to the success of your coming ministry. The thickness of your foundation and these private victories of sand and concrete of the Holy Spirit are directly proportional to the the size and success of your coming ministry. God doesn't dig a 30-foot deep foundation and pour 8-foot thick walls to build a storage shed on it. He does that type of thing to put a skyscraper on. So the little acts of obedience, those little tiny things that God has you do, are very, very important in your life. Public victories become very, very heavy. I've watched it crack even the greatest of men. Pride sneaking in. God having to tear the pride down. This whole issue of authority and power is not an issue of God's inability. Or God's not wanting to. It's an issue of you and me and what price we're willing to pay to walk in holiness and take up our cross and follow him. So many gifted people aren't willing to take up their cross. They're willing to take up their gift. But they're not willing to take up the cross. So many gifted people are willing to to spend the time with the Lord. So many gifted people think that that gift is all all that there is and that relationship with the Father is really inconsequential. We'll have that for eternity, so why worry about it now, I've been told. Those, Those type of attitudes form very, very weak foundations and lead to ministries that when weight is placed upon that foundation, the house cracks. And eventually, the building falls. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to produce strong foundations in those that I teach. I'm trying to help you have a long life in your gift. More so, I'm hoping to inspire you to have a relationship with Jesus. One is not tacit to just knowing about him, but one that is knowing him. Your gift will flourish if you do. Now, some of you may be saying, well, if all I'm doing is having a relationship so my gift will flourish, then what good is that going to do? Well, here's what happens. You may start out in the flesh seeking God, but you will not stay in the flesh seeking God. You may have ulterior motives that even you don't know when you, when you go to seek God. But the more you seek him and the more you know him, ulterior motives evaporate. And longings for that feeling, that presence, the, the, just the, 
the atmosphere of his presence. There's hardly a day that goes by that I don't weep reading the Word of God. Because his presence becomes so, so strong. It's not that I'm a weeper. I'm not a weeper. Except when God's Spirit comes. And then I'm a blubbering idiot. But, oh, his presence. And I'm going to, it's good to come to a place where his presence means more than his gift. Doesn't make a difference what your gift is. It's good to come to a place where his presence means more than his gift. Where his presence, you love his presence more than your gift operating. I can truly say, if I had a choice between the gift operating and having his presence, I would take his presence. Every time. Every time. But that doesn't come because you you've, don't discipline yourself. That doesn't come because you don't spend time in the Word. That doesn't come because you don't seek Him. It comes because you have sought Him. You have desired Him. And you, are, you do the little tiny things. Even if it's turn the radio off, turn the radio on. Even if it's what, what is going to happen in the, in, the, in the football game, running play, passing play, going to the right, going to the left, off tackle, off, off left guard, whatever it is, God is interested in communing with you. If you'll let him do it, he will teach you in so many ways. And it'll be part of this little sands that you're building, putting into the sand pile, so to speak, so that when the concrete of the Holy Spirit is added to it, the foundation is strong. So this issue of obedience, this issue of obedience, 1 Samuel 15, 22. So Samuel said, has, has the Lord uh, as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Now, there are two forms of obedience. One is obedience itself. One is called submission. And obedience involves, inv- you can have a poor attitude and be obedient. You cannot have a poor attitude and be submissive. God may tell you, give, give the hundred dollars that's in your pocket. And you may say, I, if I give the hundred dollars in my pocket, I won't have food to eat. Son, give the hundred dollars in your pocket. If I give the hundred dollars in my pocket, I won't have gas money to get home. So this is the devil, not God. Son, give the hundred dollars. If I give the hundred dollars, that's more than my tithe. I already paid tithes. What do you mean give an extra hundred over my tithe? Son, give the hundred dollars. Okay, get off my back. That's obedience. Submission. Son, give the hundred dollars. Okay, this is great. Kingdom advances, there must be something that's worth my hundred dollars, that's worth the kingdom advances, a hundred dollars worth when I give this hundred. Something of God says, I want you to help my kingdom advance, give the hundred dollars. Done, God. Hundred dollars in the plate. That's submission. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God loves an obedient giver. But it does say, God loves a cheerful giver, and you cannot be cheerful without being submissive. See, cheerful, submission involves the attitude. Obedience involves the act. And you can be obedient without and have a poor attitude. Obedience is a child who's eating breakfast, and the mom says, son, sit down and eat your cereal. And the child goes, no. Nope. And the mother says, son, sit down and eat your cereal. And the little boy goes, no. And the mother says, son, I said, sit down and eat your cereal. And the little boy goes, no. So the mother walks over to him, grabs him by his shoulders, sits him down on the chair, and says, eat your cereal and stay seated. 
And as she walks away, the little boy goes, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside. That's obedience. It is not submission. Too many times we do obedient things, but we do not do submissive things. It's important to have a submissive attitude to God. I want to submit myself to you, Father. Take me. Use me. I've said, I've even said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm telling you, please do this to me. Take me, use me, whatever you want to do with me. I'm, I'm yours. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, not my will be done. And Lord, I'm telling you right now, I am in a sound mind. I know later I won't be. Later, I will tell you, stop it. Don't listen to me then. Listen to me now. I will not be in my right mind then. I am in my right mind now. Just forget what I'm about to say because I know I'm going to say it. So don't listen to me when I say it. Just keep on going, God. You And, and everything's going to be okay because I know me. I know I will go, Why do, I didn't mean it when I said that. Don't you do that to me. And God said, no, sorry. You're not in your right mind now. Because I know me. I'm going to do that. Or I used to do that. I try not to do that anymore, but I've done that, definitely done that historically. So I, 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 this issue of submission in building the private victories. See, submission, nobody knows you have a poor attitude. God does. It builds private victories and allows God to put weight on your shoulders. Private victories ensure the growth of faith. David said, again, because he killed the lion and the bear, God will lead him to kill Goliath. There can be no consistent public victories without a consistent history of private victories. Private victories form the foundation that can withstand the weight of public victories. Consistency in private victories is developed individually over time. You picked up one piece of paper. Yes, that's a private victory. He said, Where's the history of that? What do you mean, history? Well, history kind of says you're going to do it more than once. Oh, I've got to do it a lot? Yes. Well, when will God act if I do that? When he chooses. When you're ready. But I want it quicker than that. See, that's our problem. We have such a 7-Eleven mentality. I want it now. I did it. Now, where is it? And God says, you're about 285,000 private victories away. So start picking up paper. Now, it may not be paper. It may be opening the door for your wife. Mm. Like the car door. Yeah. Ooh. You mean like take out the trash? Yeah. Ooh. You mean like make the bed? Ooh. Like clean the toilets? Ooh. I'm a man of God, God. Yes, do it. That's, you start doing that type of thing on a consistent basis, you'll build up a history of private victories and change won't scare you. You'll anticipate victory in the midst of change. Private victories form the foundation that can withstand the weight of public victories. Private victories give you the faith and courage to act when God asks you to do something you would never have considered doing before. Private victories must greatly outnumber public victories. And no one will know it but God. Video camera back down to the front. Hang on, I'll be right there. Ooh, there we go. So, who got some nuggets out of that?
Go ahead and shoot one. I got, I, don't, I, don't, I got lots of nuggets, but there's only one I'm going to share. But which, who got some nuggets? You should clean the toilet if you don't think you should. Okay. Yeah, that, that could be one. David strengthened himself in the Lord. Isn't that amazing? You know, what, what does the world teach? It takes a what? A village, right? Yeah, everybody else has to help, right? What's God? You can strengthen yourself in the Lord. Now, he didn't say you can do on his own, because the other thing the world teaches is you can make yourself who you want to be. No, you strengthen yourself what? In the Lord. Okay, and that's, that's an important thing. Because uh, what happens is we like to strengthen ourselves and then have, and then either go to God and say, hey, f- hey, fix what I want fixed, or hey, I'm strengthening myself, but things still aren't going well. God, where are you in the process? The problem is you strengthen yourself, but not what? In the Lord. Anybody else? Ooh, that's a good one. Difference between submission and obedience. Yeah. So what is the difference? That's right. Submission is doing it. They're, they're both the, they both involve the same act, right? Just a question of how you do it. Well, I'm going to do this for the Lord because I want some out of him. That's not submission, is it not? <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm going to follow these commands. I'm going to put offering in there. And it goes, and, you know, I did my duty for the Lord. Well, that's, that's obedience. But God doesn't want obedience. He wants submission. He wants us to lay down our life. And then what happens? He says, I will then give you what? you want. Like we talked about today. You want gifts from God. You want this from God. Hey, next week we're going to talk about the physical things God can do. Isn't that great? All these things. But the problem is we, we think God, see when we do it by obedience, what, what attitude forms in our head? It's a really nasty three letter word. Starts with an O. Ends with an E. Oh, we think God owes us. Yeah, I know, I know it's hard to figure that one out. I, I, I know. Right, but you know, you, you, you look so surprised when you said it. <laughs> Oh, we, we, when, you, when you do out of obedience, you think God owes you. When you do it out of submission, you're doing it because you love him. And then what God says, I want to do things for you because I love you and I want to. <clears throat> what a whole different perspective that is. <clears throat> if you're doing it out of obedience, I mean, who, who wants to talk to you? want to know why you're not hearing the voice of God? I'm obeying God. Well, then that's why you're not hearing God because you're just doing it like he said in the thing to get the guy, like, just get off my back, God. You don't want me to get that $100, get, get off my back. There's no God, do, hey, you're asking me to do this thing. It sounds crazy to me, but it must be great in your plan. And if it's great in your plan, and I'm part of that plan, that means something great must happen to me. That's the way we should look at it. Comes the money, comes the, like, picking up the thing. Well, that's somebody else's job. You know what, if you come on the church property, and you see a piece of garbage on the ground, pick it up. Right? God put it there to give you an opportunity to see if you're submissive. Next Sunday morning you come in, I'm going to have all kinds of garbage across. No, kidding. No. I, wouldn't, I couldn't stand it if I tried that. <laughs> Every time I walk to church, I see something on the ground. I don't know what it is. I just have, I'm just compelled when it comes to Sunday morning to pick it up. I won't see it the whole week long, or I will see it the whole week long, and nor it the whole week long. When it comes to Sunday morning, I'll pick these little things up all over the place because then it bothers me because people are coming on the property. <clears throat> but, you know, are, are we submissive? Anybody else got one before? We don't got... It was a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, where he gives you a gift. Yeah. Well, think about it. Are you going to give a gift to somebody who's just obedient, like the little, like the little child? I, I'm sitting, but not on the inside. I'm standing, you know? Why is God going to bless that type of attitude? See, people want to... See, people... That, that's where religion comes in. Obey everything, do everything, and this is supposed to work out in your life. That's why a lot of people leave Christianity. That's why a lot of people in mainline churches don't have the gifts in their lives, don't see God move in their lives, and they think God, and they don't put their trust in God because they're doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, right? But God never asked for that. Yeah, he wants us to do that, but not to check things off on our list of, I did this for the Lord, but say, I'm doing it because I love you with a willing heart and with a nice big smile. <clears throat> on that note... Can you be submissive and not like it? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's, that's the key. Can you do something you don't want to do, but still do it with a good attitude? <clears throat> that's the life God blesses. Now, 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 sometimes he'll ask us to do those things in our ministries. You know, everybody has a ministry, right? Everybody, you know, said working at the church or at your job or the people that are in your lives, they sometimes can be a ministry all themselves. But, you know, what's God say? You know, and they might... And, for you to all end. They say, God, okay, I, I, I'm part of the plan. I'm a part of the plan of something good in my life. I'm going to do, even though I don't like to do it. It's okay not to like. God's, see, the, one of the other things is God's always going to ask you what you want to do. No, that ain't true. God's always going to make you do something that, that, that is in your wheelhouse. No, that ain't true. Huh? That's really not true. And what's he going to, he's going to do that one because he wants to, he wants to expand you and make you better, but you have to, but in order to do something outside of your wheelhouse, see, when God asks people to do something, and I get this all the time, well, I, I'm doing what God asked me to do, it's not in my wheelhouse, not in my comfort zone, whatever you want to use, you, you know the language I'm talking about, and, and God asked me to do this, but, you know, um, uh, I, I did it because he asked me, but it was miserable. Well, you know what, it was miserable because you did it because he asked you. Hey, look at me like I'm crazy. Some of you are right now. If you do it just because he asked you, just because he was, he, from, and usually they're saying, well, God's pushing me back. No, he said, hey, God asked you. Yeah, he knows it's out of your comfort box, but he wants to say, I will, I will do it anyways. Even though I don't like doing it, I'm going to put a smile on my face anyways. And that's when God blesses, and that's when you find things in your life that you never knew about yourself. But the key is submissive obedience. Which one's which? Anything else before I get to my one thing? Because I know it's... Yeah, oh, Brenda, go ahead. Oh, is that right? Yeah, hey, you know, and, and that's so great for a Pentecostal church. Because you know what? People are so focused on the... Remember this morning I said gifts? Everybody and I said it wasn't spiritual gifts. I mean, half the people in the room like, whoa, whoa, yeah. You know, because we hear that in a Pentecostal church. God wants to give gifts. But you know, we get so focused on these if these things and that happen, if this doesn't happen, we haven't had church. But what's God want you to do? He wants you to be in his what? Presence. Because here's the deal. If you're in his presence, okay, why does God give the gifts to the church? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll debate later. What's the real purpose of his gifts? To draw us, to draw us where? Into his presence right why does he do the miracles why because he wants to show us in a real way he's in his presence he would rather just just get there in his presence just say hey i want to be there but sometimes he has to do things that in order because what we, we're humans and we lose our our attention span and we go after this and go after that and then he then the gifts show oh this is a great thing and then what happens the problem is we focus on the gifts rather than the purpose of the gifts which is to show us that god's still here and he says guess what you could be in my presence with or without the supernatural gift happening. And God would much prefer you to get into his presence without the supernatural gift. And here's why. You want to guess why? Because if you always have to wait for the supernatural, and when the supernatural doesn't happen, you'll think God's presence isn't around. The supernatural is wonderful. I love to see the supernatural happen. But I'd much rather say, hey God, hey, good morning. Hey, I want to be in your presence right now. That's all it takes. A lot of people chase God. Taste this church, taste that, taste that, taste that. Well, you know what? You can be in God's presence anywhere. The gifts of God can happen anywhere. It don't have to happen in the church. I have one of my pet peeves is, you know, I didn't see any gifts happening in the church. You know, really, it should happen out in your workplace, in your family. You know, that's, it's just this bring this unsaved to the Lord. If you're truly a Christian, you, should, you, should, you have the right to always be in what? God's presence. You can come boldly to any time, even when you mess up. You can be in his what? presence you know what because if you're in God's presence what don't you need huh anything else how about specifically this when you're in God's presence you're in the supernatural you don't need the supernatural because you're in his presence guess what he envelops you when you, when you get in his presence it's not like here and me, me and Chris here this is I'm in her presence but when you're in God's presence, he's all around you. You're, it says you're enveloped in him. Guess what? If you're enveloped in God, nothing can hurt you. 
in that moment. Oh yeah, people will try to do things. But if you stay in his presence and God's going to protect you because if they come after you and you're in his presence, guess who else they're coming after? They're coming after God, the person you're with. And the great thing about God is he's not just in front of you. And they come, he env- it says he envelops us. Isn't that a great word? All right, we've got, we got to get to the homework in a second, but I'll tell you what I liked. And it talked about, you know, the, the, the private victories, right? And then you had the one, you know, you're 285,000 private victories away from a public one, right? Here's a great quote he had there. The reason why you need to go through all the private victories is so you can bear the weight of public victories. You know, what's wrong with the, a lot of people in the church today is why people get their feathers ruffled and why people, and why things, and, and why churches don't go the way. Because everybody's so concerned about seeing God do something in their life or seeing them using a public gift or a public way this way. Just, once you're using a public victory, guess what happens? You become a what? You become a target. Every time God moves in someone's life, what happens? People go, they either, oh, that's great. On the other side it says, oh, is that fake? Is that really real? Is that going on? And here's the deal. You need a gazillion private victories because once you, once you step into the public place, like say the pulpit, you know, you're going to have... You got people that are going to come at you all the time because you're now what? In the public. You know, it, 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 I find it amazing. You know, every, every, and no, no one wants this job. Right? No one wants to stand there and tell everyone else what, what, what God says, right? Because what? You know, everything gets criticized this way 18,000 different ways, right? You know what? You can't get in that pulpit unless you know how to get some private victories. Because here's the deal, the weight of the public victory will wear you down if you don't have that spiritual muscle build up. Because we, we, we want to, oh, look, look what God did for me today. I gave a message in tongues or an interpretation or a prophecy. And then, but then you get all the criticism that comes along because that's just what happens because we as humans are mean. That's, that's the truth, isn't it? But you know what? When we get all those private victories, then we know when God has to do something public, there'll be weight behind us. We'll know, be able to stand for that and be able to stand for what is right all the time. That's the hard part about public victories. You've got to be willing to stand behind it. You know, my wife and I have this conversation all the time. Why in the world do I do this? And she reminds me, God called you. God equips those he calls. We go through this whole process. But you know, I look back on all the little victories behind. That's why every morning I come in here and pray. If you call between 8.30 and 9.30, render will tell you he's in his devotions. No, I'm not ignoring you. Okay? But I do that. Because, you know, I've got to have those private moments. Or I can't have the public life. You know, it's easy to sit there. But you know what? Your public life's on display in the workplace. Maybe in your families. Maybe in among friends. Or people you think are friends and aren't friends. You know, it's amazing how people switch all over the time, don't they? But you've got to have... A ton of private victories. See, a lot of people go, well, I want to be used of God. And they wonder we're not being used of God yet because they haven't built enough private victories up. Because a lot of people are so focused on seeing, because if you're focused on the public victory, what are you focused on? How you look. When you focus on the private victory, is it that what nobody else sees? Then you're communing with God on a deep level. So when you do do the public thing, and God asks you to do the public thing, guess what happens? You're doing it the right attitude and God protects you even against the naysayers that come against you. Why? Because you, it's not, because you really are making sure you're following who? God. It's a key thing. I guess really awesome. All right, well, we can... Wanna, uh, it's a little bit before 7. I'm going to get the homework out and then if you want to talk, we can talk. Uh, so here we go. Oh, I don't need this. I need the clicker. So here we go. So, our prayer journal, to-do list, here we go. Our, let's read. Our readings this week are Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I should have passed. Yeah, okay. Yes. All right. All right, here we go. Take, uh, take one, pass it around. All right. Take a cup here, pass it around. Um, here we go. Here we go. Uh-huh. Really? Oh, good mom. Don't send son. 
All right. And Debbie, can pass one over to her, please, because I only have one left for Sherry. Okay. All right. So here we go. So first off, where we read Matthew 6, 1 through 4, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Proverbs 20, 21, and Proverbs 12, 25. Do it one more time for those online. <coughs> Matthew 6, 1 through 4, 1 Samuel 15, 22, Proverbs 21, and Proverbs 12, 25. Everybody out there got that written down? No. Okay, give you a second. Uh. Already? Already? Okay. Our reflections this week. <clears throat> Take time to think about a few attributes of godly character you'd like to have in 10 years. <clears throat> Take, a, take time to think about a few attributes of godly character you'd like to have in 10 years. We spent the last few weeks talking about a godly character. What would you like to develop? Now, this, is, now what I'm tra- what this question is talking to you about is, what would you like to see your life become? Another way you could phrase this question, pick someone in the Bible you'd like to emulate. And then, ha- and then, see, and then start. It's, remember, it's a journey. We talked about this morning. We're all projects, right? Projects take time. Even the people that get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues overnight, guess what? Their journey just begun. It hasn't, they haven't been completed that moment in time. We're always a project. Now in those 10 years, you might think of something and you want to put this somewhere, you'll remember it. 10 years down the road, you come tell me, hey, I I accomplished it. 10 years, hey, something else changed. But what you think you would like to become. Does God give you the desires of your heart? And if you're truly communing with God by now and you're really learning how to hear his voice, you'll be able, what you're true, you'll be able to find out what really is what you need in your life. And when you both, when you and God come together on that, it will happen. The problem is when we want something that we never were meant to be. All right, next up. Everybody good with that one? Okay, the next reflection. God is not looking for perfect people, praise God. But willing people, think about times in your life where you not where you were not willing, and how can you learn from that? So you heard some neat examples. God is not looking for perfect people, but willing people. Think about times in your life where you were not willing, and how you can learn from that. So what this means is the next time I ask you to do something, you can't say no. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm not saying that. But how many times... I can tell you how many times I've seen people miss opportunities in their lives. They say, well, I, I, that's not for me. Or I, I can't do that. You know what? Usually, when God asks you to do something, it isn't for you, and you can't do it. <clears throat> because God wants to show His glory through you by giving you the ability to do that, making you love it, and giving you a talent you didn't first possess. Sometimes I find that the most miserable people in the church are people that do things they're already gifted in. Naturally, not spiritually. You know why that is? Because because after a while they get bored or this is just what I do. Well, God wants to do what? New things in your life. The only way to do new things is to actually try something new. And you know what? And when you do something new, you don't know everything about that subject. And God wants to stretch you, but in a good way. So you become stronger, and your shoulders become more broad, and you can be. And when that happens, you can be used more of the Lord. Now, this week, when you see my phone on the, you see me on the phone call, you're all going to just let it go to voicemail and ghost me. I know that. I get that. <laughs> but that's the thing. But look at times like you missed that and say, "Man, you know," and ask the question: What if I would have done that? Now, you don't want to dwell on that, but, say, but it teaches you in the future, hey, let's not miss an opportunity. There must be a reason. And every time something comes into your life, you should ask a reason. Is this from God or not from God? Sometimes we just make our mind, hey, that's just not, not who I want to be. Okay, it might not be who you want to be, but it doesn't mean that's not what God wants you to be. See, so we, we can't get to the point where we're, we're know-it-all people. <laughs> I know exactly who I am. Yeah, I know who I am in Jesus, but you know what? 
if you truly are, if you truly know who you are in Jesus, you also know that you've given your life over to him to mold and make you however you want. You know, those wonderful hymns talking about, you know, the potter and the wheel. And all of it. Let, you're the clay. I'm the clay, you're the potter. We sing that song, right? You, you ever heard that old hymn? If you haven't heard that old hymn, maybe we should sing that hymn. Okay? At some point. You know? But here's the thing. You sing the hymn. The question is, are you really the clay? Right? Is he really the potter? Does he have the ability to make you however he wants? Or are you just a bunch of rocks? They can't be molded in anything. Well, actually, rocks can't be molded, but it takes a lot of chiseling, hammering, and a lot of hard work. You don't, don't want to be a rock. You want to be a nice lump of warm, moldy clay. Or moldable clay, not moldy. Moldy is probably the wrong word. All right, so... All right, so our Bible and then our meditation verse this week is 1 Corinthians 1, 28 to 29. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 28 to 29. Oh dear Lord, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for bringing us here, Lord, to learn more about hearing your voice. I thought there were some amazing nuggets in tonight's lesson, Lord, and we thank you for that. And just to bless us as we go our way tonight, Lord, and continue, Lord, to endeavor to hear your voice even more clearly than we ever have. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. Well, if you need to go, you can go. If you have any other questions or you thought something was interesting about the lesson, I will stay as long as you want. Meaning 8 o'clock. That's a joke. But anybody else have something they thought was interesting or you all good? All good? Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool, cool. As Greg would say. A cousin does not do this class. Okay.